We're gonna go over how you can compete like a savage, and we're gonna start right now. So you're a high school thrower or a collegiate thrower. You go into that shot competition or the discus comp, or maybe you're even throwing hammer or javelin, and you start to warm up for the competition. You take that first throw. It doesn't feel great, but it doesn't feel bad, but it doesn't go as far as you want. And you take that next standing throw and you start to throw a little bit harder. You're blasting out of the front of the circle, and it's still not going as far as you want it to go. And then you start to have a little bit of frustration building up, and you take that first South African, and you start launching that South African, but you're blasting out of the front of the circle. And then you start to transition into those full throws. And it's the same thing. You're starting to feel a little bit better, but you're not saving the throws. You're getting a little frustrated. You're wondering what's gonna happen in that competition. And you start to doubt everything that you have done building into this meet. And you start to think, what could I be doing better? And I think this is something that a lot of high school throwers and collegiate throwers deal with on a regular basis. I think the most important thing that we have to do as throwers is to break down and look at that competition through throws three different lenses. So the first step is to identify pre-meet. The second step is to identify the warm-up. And then the third step is to identify the competition. And if you can break that down into those three areas, then you can zero in and mine down into what you should be doing specifically in each and every aspect. And I wanna share a big story here. One of the differences between Sam Mattis, who's top three, top four in the entire world, and someone else who might be top 10 in the United States, but doesn't prepare as well, is that Sam will look at what am I going to be doing for a pre-meet? You know, when he threw 68 meters last year in Tucson, 2022, he prepared for about 30 minutes in that pre-meet. He understood that during that pre-meet period, I wanna be focused on my technique. I wanna be identifying any mobility issues that I have, and I really want to warm up effectively for that. I wanna make sure that I have enough fuel in my body, so I'm gonna consume very specific foods so that I feel good during my competition. That's gonna happen during the pre-meet. Also, during that time frame, if Sam likes to listen to music or wants to listen to music, he'll be listening to music as he goes through his cues and his visualization. So what you can take from Sam, who's a world-class thrower, is now go, okay, I identify my mobility routine. I'm going to work on visualizing and setting up my specific cues for the competition. I'm gonna listen to music if I wanna listen to music and minimize my distractions. Now, compared to someone who's a top 10 US thrower, that top 10 US thrower goes to the track and for the 30 minutes leading into the warm-up, they're clowning around, they're goofing off, they're not focusing on their visualization, they're not establishing any sense of mobility routines, and they're not even sure what they should be focusing on when they're warming up. So you need to establish that there's that pre-meet period, and that pre-meet period plays a major role in that warm-up period. Okay, so now taking that pre-meet and working into the actual warm-up, okay? So you have that pre-meet. Let's say that's starting 45 to 30 minutes prior to the warm-up. And even during that time frame, you can take your caffeine during your pre-meet. Now we get into the warm-up. So the warm-up will occur when the officials open the circle. They take that cone out and everybody's ready to go. Everybody's ready to go drop some big, huge bombs. This is where we need to establish during the pre-meet, we did the mobility work, we did visualization, we took that caffeine, we listened to music, maybe we did a general warm-up. Now we get into the main warm-up period and we identify how many standing throws am I going to take? One to two. We don't compete with a standing throw, we compete with a full throw. Take one to two standing throws. Next step, am I taking any variations like a half turn or a South African? I would recommend just take one to two standing throws, do drills on the side to warm up specifically for the movement, and then go right into full throws. And you can take two to three non-reverses, and then one full throw if you have time. Or you can take two standing throws, you could take one to two non-reverses and one to two full throws. And this is almost exactly what Sam did when he hit that 68 meter throw in Tucson. He went into the circle, didn't even take any standing throws, but went right into two to three non-reverse throws and then two to three full throws. Okay, so identifying during the warm-up period, what are the cues I'm gonna be focusing on? One to two cues, how many standing throws, how many non-reverse throws and how many full throws. And ideally we will be taking more full throws than anything else and they should be done at 60 to 70%.
We don't need to be the warm-up kings. Don't focus on that until later on when you're on the level of Joe Kovacs. Watch that video on don't be a warm-up king, by the way. Now compare Sam's warm-up period to the individual who's just a top 10 US discus thrower. And not, I don't wanna downplay just a US top 10. The US top 10 discus thrower might take one standing throw, two standing throws, and then they might come in and be concerned that standing throw didn't go as far as their stands went when they hit their PR, so it's not gonna be a good day. Then we're gonna go take a non-reverse throw. Then we're gonna go take a full throw. Then we're gonna go back and take another non-reverse throw. And then we're gonna go back and take a full throw. So there's much less of a plan in the warm-up period for the individual that's a top 10 thrower versus the individual who's top five in the world, okay? And then that takes us into the competition. So we had the pre-meet, we had the actual warm-up, then we have the actual competition. The first throw, what are we doing? What's one cue that we can focus on? And if you just look at Sam's series, all right, one cue, I'm gonna go in 80% and I'm gonna hit it. Okay, 80%, first throw 80%. One cue, 80% intensity, take a good strong first throw, get that mark. Sam's throw I believe was around 65 meters. A very solid mark, right? Very solid opener. Compare that to the top 10 individual who ends up blasting out of the front of the circle and leaving the discus down that right sector. And then all of a sudden, a greater sense of anxiety overcomes them. And that leads to a bad position inside of that competition. Now, if you go out and you hit that first throw at 80% and you get a very strong mark, you can get after it. You can take the second and third throw basically because you're in that position where you're in the final. Now, I can go ham. I can take advantage of these next two throws. I can dial it up a little bit more, okay? I can sit there and try to smash one. And Sam did that in that specific competition, 67 plus meters. So you start to see, all right, if I take advantage of my pre-meet effectively, and I start to take advantage of my warm-ups and I plan them out effectively, and I follow that plan to a T, and I actually have a plan, and then I go into the actual competition, if I focus on that first throw really well, that sets me up to have more throws at a greater intensity. Now, if we're the individual who maybe misses that first throw, you start to bring in some doubt, and then that second throw, you have to dial it down. You have to take that around 75 to 80%. Okay, now if you get that second mark, and you're the individual who missed that first throw, the second throw now is your 80%, 75 to 80%, and then we go into the third throw, and ideally we can back that up with a little bit stronger of a mark so that we can make the final. In Sam's case, his second throw and his third throw are going to be blast mode, okay? I want to slam this as hard as possible. And what that does is that puts us in position now, if we know we're getting three more throws, we can analyze, this is what happened in throw two, this is what happened in throw three at higher intensity, positive and negative. Now, that fourth throw, if we've had good throws in round two, good throws in round three, we keep building, we just keep it rolling. If we haven't had the best of throws in round two or round three at higher intensity, we bring in one technical cue. We bring in a familiar technical cue. We don't make up a cue that we haven't been focusing on in training. We bring in a familiar technical cue. We still try to keep that speed at a higher intensity. So now on round four, we have that one cue, higher intensity, and we see what happens. The individual who doesn't have a plan or who has a sporadic plan, Typically in round four, round five, we'll come in with a cue that they are not familiar with. They'll sort of make something up. They'll pull a cue out of the air that they used six or seven months ago to see what will happen. And then in most cases, this individual might have a decent throw in round four or five. And then round six, they go in, they try to slam a huge throw and they blast out of the front of the circle and they don't get a good mark. In Sam's case, especially in Tucson, round four, round five, huge bombs come. Round six, dial it up as hard as possible and just try to crank one. Typically, by that point, you might be a little bit more fatigued, but you've taken advantage of all those specific throws beforehand. So in reality, if we go backwards, in the pre-meet period, that's 45 minutes leading into the warm-up. Identify your mobility. Identify your visualization period. When will you be sitting there thinking about your throws and what one or two cues will you be focusing on? and bring that all together and start to think about that routine and when you're even gonna be taking your caffeine and what music you might be listening to. During the warm up, identify how many stands you're gonna take, how many nons, how many full throws. And then also, if you're in a time crunch, which throws will be taken out. 
Know this plan ahead of time. It will de-stress everything. Finally, when we get into the competition, first throw, 80% with one cue. Second, third throw, you can slam if you've gotten a good mark in the first round. Fourth, fifth throw, you can revisit what has happened. If you need to adapt with another cue at a higher intensity, by all means do that. Round six, if you're in a good position, just try and murder the throw at absolute high speed with really, really tight positions, and hopefully that results in a huge PR. But the ultimate lesson here is that you have to plan everything out ahead of time so that you can de-stress, you can manage your anxiety, and you can turn all that adrenaline into a huge bomb. So implement these plan today so that you can drop those huge bombs. If you need help with your training, head over to throwsuniversity.com. You can pick up a technical analysis or a training program so that you can drop some bombs. Until next time, guys, peace. <laughs>